Hello and welcome to bacterial infections. Today we're going to talk about Staphylococcus and Streptococcus. And when you listen to this lecture, you'll be able to know the structure and virulence factors produced by the Staphylococci and the Streptococci. You'll be familiar with the pathogenesis and the epidemiology of diseases associated with Staphylococci and Streptococci. You'll know which drugs can be used to treat staphylococcal and streptococcal infections, and you'll become acquainted with the available streptococcal vaccines. Let's dive into staphylococci first. These are causative agents of abscesses and toxin-mediated diseases. Here we have a photograph of Staphylococcus aureus. These are gram-positive cocci and they're often called grape-like clusters. Don't they look like grapes to you? Purplish. So that's uh, the morphological appearance of staphylococci. Staphylococci colonize the nose and other mucous membranes and the skin of 30 to 40 percent of humans. 30 to 40 percent of people are carrying these bacteria as part of their normal Flora, not everyone, all right, but some of them do in your nose, mucous membranes, even on your skin. These bacteria, nevertheless, under some situations, can cause a variety of diseases. They include focal abscesses. And what we mean by that is an abscess in a very specific place, like on the skin where it would be a boil. Many of you may have had boils before, focal infections, a, a very raised pus-filled lesion. We'll see some of these in a moment. And, but these can also occur inside of you, not just on your skin. For example, in your lungs, bones, other organs, kidneys, and heart. A general feature of the staphylococci is that they secrete potent exotoxins. We talked about exotoxins in a previous lecture on bacteria. These are proteins that are produced and elaborated from the bacteria that have effects on the host. In the case of staphylococci, these include the toxic shock syndrome toxin, staphylococcal scalded skin syndrome, and food poisoning. These are all a consequence of the production of toxins. The toxic shock, the scalded skin, the food poisoning are all consequences of toxin production and their effects. So among the toxins that staphylococci produce are lipases and hydrolases. These have as an effect to degrade the lipids of your skin, and that in part contributes to the production of these boils. These staphylococci can spread from person to person via aerosols, respiratory spread produced by coughing or sneezing or even talking. Did you know that as I'm speaking now, I'm actually making an aerosol. And so if you were standing right in front of me, you could be infected. And it's in particular, letters like P, P where I'm p sending out puffs of aerosol, that's one way that people can spread. I don't have to sneeze or, talk or, or cough. So person to person by respiratory aerosols or by direct contact, these bacteria can be transmitted. Of course, if you already have the staphylococci, this is not relevant. But as I said, there are many people who don't have them, and they can acquire them from others by these routes of transmission. Now, as I said before, they're on a certain percentage of humans on the skin, and they remain there harmlessly, typically, and they don't penetrate unless there's damage to the skin. You have a cut that pushes the staph aureus deeper, and it can then cause an infection, or in a mucous membrane as well. If you have a cut uh, in the inside of your mouth, it may introduce the bacteria into deeper tissues where it can then cause a problem. So if they are left in their normal places, they're okay, and problems arise when there are damages occurring. So things like burns, wounds of various sorts, lacerations, even an insect bite, certainly surgery, variety of skin diseases, all these conditions can let Staph aureus come in. When you have surgery, the, one of the first things they do is to extensively wash the skin where you're going to be cut with a, a, a preparation to sterilize the area or reduce the number of bacteria. 
If that's not done properly, the Staph aureus will be introduced into the wound and you can have serious infections of the sort that we're going to talk about. So let's look at an abscess. Here's a photograph of a man. Uh, you may think that this is, in fact, a nipple, but it's not. It's an abscess caused by a staphylococcal infection. The nipple is a little bit south of this uh, boil on his chest. So this is an example of a boil caused by a staphylococcal infection. Many people have had these. Here, the infection remains localized. It is in this boil, and it doesn't go beyond that. This boil contains pus, and that's called an abscess, or a furuncle. Interesting word, furuncle is one boil like this. A carbuncle is when you have several boils together, it makes a larger structure. Furuncle, carbuncle. So this is, the, this is a typical boil, we call them colloquially, or an abscess. When the bacteria spread beyond the initial boil in subcutaneous or submucosal tissues, this is called cellulitis. So the staphylococcal infection, when it spreads beneath the skin, cellulitis. As you might predict, one of the main immune defense cells important for regulating staphylococcus replication and spread are neutrophils. These maintain a balance of the bacteria in normal people, and if you're neutropenic, that can be a problem in controlling staphylococcal infections. Very early in infection, so let's say you have a cut, you, and that introduces the staphylococci, which you happen to have on your skin, into deeper tissues. There is a battle between the bacteria and your immune system involving neutrophils and other cells. Early in the infectious process, many neutrophils are killed by the bacteria. And these release lysosomal enzymes. The neutrophils are full of them. It's part of their armamentarium for killing bacteria. When the neutrophil dies, they're released into the tissue. And those enzymes then damage your tissue, and they contribute to the formation of a boil. Let's take a little bit of a deeper look at what this boil actually is, or abscess in more precise terminology. So here is a diagram of the abscess on this slide. An abscess is walled off with a capsule made of fibrin. This is a host reaction to the bacteria. The host makes a fibrin capsule to try and uh, restrict the bacteria to this one place. Now, the consequence of this is that the bacteria are also isolated from the immune response. So it's actually a consequence both of host and bacterial action. Within this boil or abscess, we have dead neutrophils, which are killed uh, by the bacteria, and this produces the pus. We have epithelial cells, we have bacteria, and fluid. And so this grows to a certain size. It's painful to a certain extent, and that's what an abscess looks like. Staph aureus makes a number of what we call virulence factors. These are toxins and other proteins that are made that help it to spread and overcome host defenses. And there are a number of them. In the center of that slide, there are the staphylococci, and you can see elaborating uh, a variety of proteins like leukocytins, uh, hemolysins, protein A, coagulases, and proteins that help make fibrin clots dissolve. Let's look at some of these in some detail. Let's take a look at some of the virulence factors produced by staphylococci. These are gram-positive bacteria with a thick outer wall of peptidoglycan, and surrounding that is a capsule, which you may remember from our basic discussion of bacteria. The capsule is important for inhibiting phagocytosis. In this picture, we have a macrophage trying to uh, take up a staphylococcus, and the capsule will inhibit that reaction. It will resist it because, of course, once the bacteria is inside of the cell, it could be destroyed. The outer surface of the bacteria just below the capsule consists of peptidoglycan, which you re may remember is alternating chains of carbohydrates cross-linked with short peptides. This product of the staphylococcus activates complement. This is a host defense against infection. And complement will have various inflammatory uh, procedures. It will cause lysis of the bacteria and production of 
cytokines. And so this is part of the inflammatory reaction that goes on inside the carbuncle. The bacteria also make a protein called protein A. This is quite an interesting protein. In the diagram, you can see the protein A uh, is on the surface of the bacterium. It's shown in that little green box. What this protein does is bind the FC portion of antibody molecules. So, you know, antibody molecules are Y-shaped molecules. The FC is down at the bottom, and the antigen bind binding sites are at the top. Normally, your antibodies would bind the staphylococcus, but the staphylococcus is binding the antibody the other way, so it can't bind the bacterium. And this reduces the ability of the bacterium to be taken up into macrophages by opsonization. Very clever strategy for avoiding that process. The, capsule, the catalase is produced by staphylococci. This is an enzyme that cleaves hydrogen peroxide. That's hydrogen peroxide, H2O2, shown right there. Hydrogen peroxide is produced by cells like macrophages. Its, its product is to destroy bacteria. Bacteria, in turn, make an enzyme called catalase, and this will cleave the hydrogen peroxide to evade destruction. Very clever. The bacteria also produce an enzyme called coagulase, which converts fibrinogen to fibrin, and that helps to make a clot that surrounds the boil and isolates the bacteria from the immune response. And staphylococci also make pore-forming toxins like hemolysins, leukocytins, and hyaluronidases that digest the extracellular matrix, all of these uh, in, an, in an effort for the bacteria to spread and avoid host defenses. And we've talked about many of those before. Staphylococcal infections are very difficult to treat. Uh, antibiotic resistance has become widespread among the staphylococcal strains that colonize us. There are many beta-lactamases uh, in these, as we discussed in another lecture on general bacteria, and those beta-lactamases encode resistance to the penicillin-type antibiotics. This, this resistance is widespread. In addition, the bacteria make a penicillin-binding protein 2A, which further makes them resistant to penicillin-class antibiotics. And you may have heard the term MRSA, or MRSA, to describe these bacteria. This stands for methicillin-resistant Staph aureus. And this is very popular in the press to talk about MRSA as a superbug because they're extremely difficult to treat, almost impossible to treat with antibiotics. So MRSA describes the most resistant of these strains of Staph aureus. So these are, these are serious infections. What kind of other uh, diseases do these cause? They cause staphylococcal scalded skin syndrome. Try and say that four times quickly. This is a skin uh, illness, as you can see here, and it, I think the name tells you what it looked like. This mainly affects neonates. This is caused by sloughing of the skin. The skin is coming off. It's red and angry looking, caused by toxins produced by the staphylococci, specifically tox exfoliative toxins A and B, exfoliation, the loss of your skin. You can also uh, describe a disease called toxic shock syndrome, TSS, which became popular not very long ago. This is accompanied by fever, skin rash, hypotension, low blood pressure, and also peeling of the skin, exfoliation. Toxic shock syndrome was first described in connection with the use of highly absorbent tampons that allowed organisms to proliferate. Now, tampons went through a, a revolution in their production where they became extremely uh, absorbent and also would block off the vaginal canal. And the makers thought this was a great thing because it's convenient for women, but it turned out that these trapped the staph bacteria uh, in the vaginal canal, allowed them to proliferate in and around the tampon and elaborate toxins. And this brand new disease that had never been seen before, toxic shock syndrome, suddenly was described. And that's a staphylococcal disease associated initially with the use of tampons, but now we know there are other causes as well. One of the main toxins produced by staphylococci that causes 
toxic shock is called TSST1, toxic shock syndrome toxin number one. And uh, this is an enterotoxin. It actually acts as a super antigen. Super antigens bind the T cell receptor and the major histocompatibility protein on the surface of cells and cause massive release of cytokines from macrophages and T cells that are then responsible for the symptoms, say, of toxic shock syndrome. The whole idea of toxic shock elaborates from these cytotoxins that are produced. Staphylococci can also cause food poisoning. We've been talking about skin diseases of various sorts, but they can also be in your food, and they produce enterotoxins that are in the food. When you eat it, these make you sick. And they, the bacteria, if they contaminate the food, and you can imagine that someone may have Staph aureus on their hands, they're preparing food, they haven't washed their hands, they don't wear gloves, you now have Staph aureus in the food. If it's not kept cold, if it's at room temperature, which sometimes happens during food production or serving, the bacteria will grow, they will produce their toxins, and when you eat it, you will get sick. This typically happens with meats, including poultry, egg products, salads, milk, and dairy products. So if you ever have been to a, a buffet where there's lots of food spread out on the table, if it sits there for hours at room temperature, the bacteria can grow and make their toxins. Next time you go to such a function, make sure the people are wearing gloves. If they're not, you should just stick with the wine and don't touch the food. This disease, when you ingest these toxins, causes nausea, vomiting, stomach cramps, and diarrhea. And it's typically a rather rapid onset. So food poisoning, where you are eating food that has a toxin in it already, the onset is quick. So if you eat something and an hour or two later you're vomiting, you can say, wow, that could be a Staph aureus toxin caused food poisoning. In contrast, if it takes a few days to get sick, that means the bacteria have to replicate in you before you get sick. So this is a rapid onset food poisoning caused by staphylococci, and then in two or three days you recover.